Moro then announced video uses Mr. Beast as the thumbnail. The YouTuber himself isn't the point of this one hour long essay. Rather, it is the trend of for profit philanthropy, also called philanthropic capitalism, and how it allows corporations to conceal or draw attention away from questionable business ethics. Mr. Beast, in particular, has a very clean reputation, even among various news outlets, being known as a selfless, heroic philanthropist who can do no wrong. But the brand is still primarily a business, a for profit philanthropy that relies heavily on sponsors. Sponsors which can and will make use of popular figures like Mr. Beast for massive positive PR. Grand spectacles like giving away 10,000 turkeys or cleaning the world's dirtiest beach make for good entertainment. But the problem here is that efforts like this ignore the underlying problem and lead only to surface level changes. It gives the impression that the current way of doing business and politics is fine. The elites have everything covered, or that simply watching an ad on YouTube can solve complicated and boring topics like global warming and poverty. Take the example of the turkey giveaway, worth 250,000 sponsored by Jenny O. It sounds like a lot, until you realize that Jenny O's parent company Hormel Foods is worth about $27 billion. 250,000 would be about the same amount for a normal advertisement that is clearly an ad. That can't be said for Mr. Beast's video, which implies that the sponsorship is a simple philanthropic act. The sanitization of their brand image is obvious when you consider that Hormel and Smithfield, both companies which Mr. Beast has worked with before, were the same companies accused of an illegal price fixing scheme to increase the prices of pork, and therefore their profits, since 2009. In other words, these sponsors were part of the problem causing people to require food donations in the first place. And they easily got a refreshed brand image as generous philanthropists. In 2021, Smithfield settled the litigation for $83 million in fines. But this kind of price fixing is more common than you might realize in the industry. Tyson Foods and Pilgrims were fined $221 million and $108 million respectively for price fixing poultry and Bumblebee CEO sentenced to 14 months in prison for price-fixing tuna. Back in 1992, the food industry spent $29 million on lobbying and political contributions. In 2020, this had increased to $175 million, of which two-thirds went to Republicans who wanted to roll back regulations further. Regulations which would drive out competition and inflate prices. And despite the growing power of wealth of giant food conglomerates, Half of the least well-paid jobs remain in the food industry, with working conditions seemingly getting worse. One study in 2013 found that 42% of poultry workers had some evidence of carpal tunnel. And at the same time, farmers are getting paid less for produce, getting into debt, and facing mental health problems. In fact, farmers are one of the most likely groups to take their own lives around the world. In another example, Mr. Beast and friends organized to clean up a dirty beach in the Dominican Republic, only to realize that the task is too insurmountable. This is when they introduced a trash-eating robot called the Ocean Cleanup and asked the viewer for a donation, with the claim that for every one dollar donated, one pound of trash can be removed from the ocean. Half of the money goes to volunteers, while the other half would go to Ocean Cleanup. The premise is, of course, problematic. Most of the 150 million tons of plastic in the ocean are microplastics which cannot be removed like this. Unsurprisingly, the sponsors for ocean cleanup include plastic manufacturers like Safilo, the world's second largest manufacturer of plastic sunglasses, Axonobel, an $8.5 billion multinational manufacturer of paint and chemicals, and Coca-Cola, the world's worst plastic polluter for the fourth year in a row in 2021. Attention has been diverted away from the systemic problem of plastic pollution, and instead now, we are focusing on a feel-good solution of a trash collecting robot. Instead of expensive advertising that nobody trusts, corporations can sanitize advertising by finding philanthropic figures that people trust, then plaster on their logo for cheap, effective advertisements. And because these figures are trusted, they also get free, positive press coverage. In the end, naive influencers and followers unknowingly spread corporate messages while believing that they're doing good, and sometimes contributing to more harm. Again, the main point here isn't to hate on Mr. Beast, it is to get you to recognize that philanthropy caught up in a web of PR and misdirection has the same effect as placing a little band-aid over a gushing wound. It only serves to make people involved look good without addressing the underlying problem. 
And this is an ongoing trend found everywhere. Coca-Cola spends about 4 billion a year on advertising and 1 billion a year on philanthropic grants. Receivers of these donations often mysteriously shift their tone towards sugary drinks. Like a pediatric dental academy initially describing soft drinks as a significant factor for tooth decay. And after a 1 million donation to describing the scientific evidence is unclear. Or an anti-obesity group which received a 1.5 million donation and handed control of their website's content to Coca-Cola's chief health and science officer. So that the blame goes to the lack of exercise and other factors rather than sugary drinks. Or that Save the Children's campaign to tax sugary sodas suddenly disappeared after a 5 million donation from Coca-Cola. In effect, these philanthropic efforts are indirect lobbying to neglect social causes for the sake of more corporate profits. Of course, some of these donations may end up benefiting society, but studies show that most donations don't end up benefiting the people in need. One study in 2012 found that just 7% of donations reach causes that can be described as a benefit to people in need. And another found that 55% of grants went to large organizations with budgets already over 5 million. The point here is, don't fall into the trap of thinking that few good solutions aligned with corporate profits or that lacking a video can replace real, boring, difficult, and often less well-funded solutions. If you liked the points above or wanted more context like how philanthropic capitalism had its origins in the late 19th century or more examples, then you should check out Dan and Now's full one hour video. Also, as I'm only summarizing the video, I should point out that I couldn't find some studies that he is referencing. If someone manages to find it, please link it in the comment. Also, also, if someone who knows Dan and Now happens to watch this, please ask him to remove the ticks that he used for transitions every year. Well, because they hurt my ears.